everyone. It's fantastic to have Neera Nandi on our 100 Women of Impact. And I must say that when I met her a few years ago, I was amazed and inspired the work which they are doing at Dasra. It inspired me to also, you know, transition into the impact space and do this kind of a work. Uh, Neera, it's amazing to have you on the show. And thank you so much for taking the time out and having this conversation with us. Thanks. I'm so excited to, to be here. Fantastic, Neera. Neera, you know, I'll straight drive into the questions, which is generally people running in mind. Okay. I've read through your very, very, I would say, impressive um, journey and the resume. And I was quite stunned with the fact that you, joined, you started Dasra at a very early stages of your career. And it's been a, a you know, a journey of a love, labor, and a lot of good intent and great impact, which as an outcome, I would say. What prompted you to start this? I mean, you were at a Harvard alma mater, and then right after that, you were a consultant for a bit, and then you started this. What what prompted you to do this? So that's very generous, um, Sarika, to think that we've had an impact. I think there's so much uh, more to do. But, you know, if I and we're celebrating 25 years next year. So it's been a long, uh, patient journey, to be honest. And to be even more honest, I'm not sure I actually had the foresight that imagined um, the possibilities of actually what Dasra is today. And maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. But at the time, it seemed very simple in that I felt I had quite a lot of privilege, not privilege of wealth, but like privilege of education, experience, exposure. You know, I grew up in Canada. Um, you know, I had very strong women in my family. You know, part of the reason we immigrated to Canada was my grandmother, uh, was a psychiatrist and ended up doing her residency. That's how we all ended up being born there, raised there. Um, and my mom was the first, you know, woman electrical engineer from IIT Kharagpur. So very strong, you know, women in my in my family made both my sister and I fairly ambitious, but also wanted to always differentiate ourselves from from men. And all that being said, we both, you know, I ended up doing math. Um, and then went into investment banking. So a lot of my early years was to prove that, you know, I could follow this pathway that everybody said would be challenging for women. So landed up in investment banking, Wall Street, Morgan Stanley, then went to, you know, HBS, you know, Harvard Business School. And I think it was honestly there that, A, I, I had a lot of self-confidence finally that, you know, I could do what I wanted. And worst case, if something didn't work out, somebody would hire me. So for me, having a job, financial independence was uh, a real motivating factor. And I think coming out of HBS, they also, you know, we talked a lot about making a difference and that, you know, a lot of leadership is about making a difference in the world. And I had worked and supported my mother who started a school outside in Karakpur, outside of IIT Karakpur to help tribal Adivasi uh, girls and boys. So there's a school out there. So I started to be very exposed to that. I worked at Women's World Banking and microfinance. So I think all of that exposure lends itself for me to really feel that there's something there to be a bridge, a bridge between where there is wealth, there is privilege, and where perhaps that wealth could really be impactful. You know, could we help organizations on the ground, think about their work, uh, grow their work, and that's really what blossomed into to being Dasra. That's that's fantastic. You know, um, if I have to really uh, put Dasra, if you have to really put Dasra in say two lines, what is what Dasra does? If you could explain it to our audience a bit, it will help to get the meaning of Dasra, which I know for us in the impact space is very ubiquitous, <laughs> but for a lot of folks out there, uh, they would like to understand what Dasra does and what is it all about. It will be fantastic to hear it in your own words. Oh, sure. So so we like to call ourselves an NGO for NGOs. I think in the simplest sense, we are in service of other NGOs and being able to support them and their mission to scale has been at the very core of Dasra and ultimately are the communities they serve really improving and, and, and living well. Um, but with that, we realized there's work on philanthropy and there's work on collaboration. So there's two engines to our work, raising money um, and making philanthropy more strategic on one side, whether it's engaging with families or corporate giving. And on the other side, it really is working with NGOs, but we really moved to building platforms and networks and collaboratives. And so these are really two sides of, of Dasra now, but at the core of it really are we impacting lives. 
that that sounds wonderful can you share nina one of one or two of your um, ngos or one or two of your social impact organizations which in your early years of starting Pastra, which was very close to your heart, could you share one or two anecdotes or examples, which which eventually became very scalable, impactful organization? I know there are quite a few, but something which is very close to your heart. Yeah, of course. I think there are many. I think the one probably that people will have heard of and probably don't know as much that we were there in the early years is Educate Girls. So I think, you know, we worked very closely with Safina and her vision when she was just in you know, 50 schools. So being able to now be working with millions of children and thousands of schools, having raised an incredible amount of, you know, funding and grown her model to bring girls into the school system has really been a phenomenal, you know, growth trajectory. And so it, it, it's been a combination of not just providing that flexible funding, but also working with, um, you know, ambitious leadership hand in hand and in, and in partnership. So just to see what Educate Girls has been able to uh, achieve, you know, is is one example. And there were a range of things over the years that we've, you know, supported them with. Uh, but I think ultimately it ends up being the leadership, right, that really ends up building the success and has less to do, honestly, with with Dasra, we are, you know, in some ways only supporting a small, small part of it, but it ends up being, you know, their dream and aspiration that really transforms. I mean, I'd say Educate Girls, I think another organization called Ungun Trust that works in child protection and care, um, you know, in homes was an organization we started working with very early on. And just to see how they've supported girls, how they've really worked with mothers, worked in hotspots, um, looking at trafficking of, of children, but also sex workers, and just the role that, you know, women play in the community to protect girls, I think has been a phenomenal growth from really building uh, how care centers are really high quality government um, homes all the way to how do you go into the community. So I think we've also worked with organizations through their arc and how they transform themselves to be relevant to kind of what the issue is and what the what the problems are. You know, other successes are Magic Bus. Um, you would have heard of Sneha here in Mumbai working on, you know, nutrition. Arman is one where really around technology for uh, maternal and child health has really been successful. It's like a voice activated phone system um, that started originally with the kind of Johnson and Johnson care that, you know, us privileged moms could access. This was really for, um, you know, women who don't have that kind of access, kind of log in where they are and they get these messages that just help them while they're um, pregnant. It's just a phenomenal organization as well. Yeah. So these are just a few. <laughs> oh gosh. So from, you know, from very, very serious concerns like human trafficking to maternal health care to educate girls. I mean, that's just a very big, diverse set of impact which Dasra has created as a catalyst in many NGOs. This is really mind boggling. Um, my next question is to talk about, we all talk about successes. And, you know, you and I know from the impact space that failures, unfortunately, in this space has you know, setbacks, I would not call it fa failures, but yeah. setbacks and challenges are integral part of the sector completely. Um, would you talk about your journey in the Dasra itself, some of the initial journey? Because, I mean, you started way back when the not-for-profit not sector, the NGO sector was not so, I would say... Uh, vibrant. <laughs> vibrant, let me put it yeah. Vibrant is the right word. Um and what were the initial setbacks and challenges which you faced when you started this? And it could be both personal as well as professional uh, when you started this. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, professionally, probably two two aspects have been have been difficult, right? I think in the very beginning, you're desperate for funding, you're desperate to sort of survive. And I think in our early years, we actually put all our eggs into one basket. Even though we came from banking, which is so funny because everybody teaches you, you know, even in math, like diversify your funding base, diversify your money. And then this guy came to us and was like, we're going to give you, I'm going to give you a million dollars for the next few years. We're like, oh my goodness, this is way more than we ever imagined. And then the huge, you know, bubble burst dot com, because we started in 1999. So we went through that real down um, bursting of the bubble and he pulled his money and we were like, oh, now we don't have funding. We had to let go of people. We had to really rethink our model. And I think for us, that was quite traumatic. I think for both Devil and I having to let go of people who in the first place, you just felt so 
humbled and so responsible that they left you felt like they left everything to come and trusted you you know to be part of that's right you feel responsible for them for their family you know you you have been in this space for 25 years you have seen some of the worst times in the not-for-profit sector and to now i would say not a vibrant but moving towards a little more vibrant um uh, on this what is your take in terms of this journey and the impact it's creating and the future which we hold for India come from here? I think that um, what has always kept us very motivated is how much the, the innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit, and honestly, the kind of talent you see in the sector, the kinds of organizations, models, interventions, whatever you want to call it, are truly innovative and cutting edge. I mean, you cannot compare what we are able to achieve um, in working with communities here in India at scale when you look outside India. I mean, whenever I'm speaking to examples of India, you know, we're in the thousands, hundreds and thousands and millions. And you speak to, you know, our US counterparts or other countries who are much smaller. And they're like, wow, we reached 50 or 100 people. And you're like, how is that? Um, you know, scale. So I'm, I I think there's a lot to be said in how we innovate the economies of scale that we're building in, how we're leveraging technology. I just think we're, we're cutting edge. I'm very hopeful, you know, in, in that regard. I think there is a careful tension between the civil society sector and the government. And we can't underestimate the need for partnering, working together, and being recognized as a real force to help government achieve their uh, agenda as well, and and ultimately to uplift and build our economy. I I now ask a separate question, uh, Niran, and this is again our challenge. We see many corporate folks now transitioning to the impact space, which is a which is a very very welcome move. Yeah. We, I get a lot of hope from the next generation, as you rightly said, the next generation wants to get involved in topics like climate change, education, health, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And if not coming directly to the impact sector within their own organizations, they are making a dent by being more focused on some of these goals, as they call it, ESG goals or CSR goals or SDG goals, whatever you call them. Yeah, I think yeah. they're all, uh, they're all uh, different names given. So I get a lot of hope on that. But one thing which I also see is impact sector has largely been attracting female talent, women talent. If you pick up any large NGO, a lot of them will have very strong women leaders. You are also a case and example. Uh, while it is great, uh, but sometimes you think it is also because we are more empathetic and it also creates a bit of a challenge that uh, it is seen as a softer sector for women talent and not attracting the other gender in the talent uh, as talent into the sector. What's your take on this? You know, some of our perspective is not reality. So I think what we see might be, you know, many women and therefore saying it's largely, you know, a women's uh sector. I think we face the ch same challenge as the private sector does in which we all enter in, right? And we're all on the front lines and perhaps to some extent in middle management, but we don't make it up to be the leaders of the organize selected as the CEOs of the organization growing from within. Well, I'm a right? Or being on the boards of, of organizations. So if you look at board constitution, you look at CEO leadership, you look at other leadership roles, I still think what plagues the private sector plagues us here in, in our sector. I think what we might benefit from is that we actually have a pretty good pipeline, but it's still the same norms, the same institutional challenges that private sector faces that you know, the social sector faces, you know, folks say, oh, well, the social sector is going to be easier. So you can, you know, figure out a more balanced life and all of that. I don't actually think that's true. No. I don't think it's because we're, you know, our feminine attributes somehow support the social sector of sorts, because as soon as you start rising, frankly, it is your masculine attributes that are that are that help you rise. I think we have to change that in in all the, the sectors. But unfortunately, I think that's still a still a challenge. What we can really benefit from, like we're 70% women at Dasra. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I think we have to be very conscious about building leadership. We've had to be very conscious about bringing women onto the boards. That's why we actually started an entire program with ISDM to a- work with corporate women to sit on uh, boards of nonprofits um, and be able to bring that you know perspective and and diversity and representation. So uh, yeah, I don't think it's as as simple as as that, but you know maybe you're onto something and we should we should research that. <laughs> <laughs> What is the one advice you would like to give for folks who want to, and, and we spoke about it a bit, but maybe from a purely, what advice, I'll rephrase it, what advice you would want to give to folks who want to transition into the impact sector? What are the do's and don'ts they should keep in mind um, when they're making that decision? I mean, I think that one is to to be mindful that it isn't the same, but it's also not dramatically different. Um, and that at, at the core of it, you're not doing anyone a favor by coming into the into the sector. I think there's a lot to be learned from the private sector, but it needs to be extended to its relevance here in, in our sector. And the complexity, the resource constraints, the time it takes to see impact just requires a, a reorientation of, of sorts is one thing. I think the second thing, Sarika, is and you know, this goes for whether you're in the sector or not in the sector, one's pathway is zigzag. So to think that your pathway is going to be, you know, a straight line, I think is a real challenge, and it can be very frustrating. So by design to recognize that zigzag, even in our sector or outside, I think is what makes the journey very exciting and can make the journey also very, one can be very thoughtful and not feel that this one you know, switch that you're going to do is going to entirely define who you are and your career. It's just one step in that zigzag. So often people overthink, you know, this, this transition. I think the third thing is there's an assumption that you have to take a pay cut and it requires you to like give up all of these, um, you know, privileges of sorts. I think the sector's changed. So I think it does recognize performance. You know, you are rewarded. There are great organizations to be able to live a very comfortable um, you know, and I would say a privileged life. So to really think about one's monetary needs, to think about budgets, how do you live and feel, you know, happy about that, I think are important decisions, you know, to make. And with that, my last question, because there will be many students yeah. um, who also be watching this webinar. Uh, what is that one advice you would give to the younger generation who want to make a transition into this career, um, especially folks who want to even have a startups in this uh, in this space, or they want to join some uh, industry to some join some existing NGO in the space. What what is that one advice you would give them? I mean, my my advice would be take all the risk right early on because you know you actually have a whole lot less to lose. You don't have a whole lot of dependency for the most part, right? And so being able to do a startup is amazing experience, right? And and take, again, it's going back to my everyone's journeys is zigzag. So you try something, it doesn't work. You've learned something for it. People really value, you know, different experiences in this day and age, that exposure, you then find the next thing. So I think just not to feel that the first decision you make out of school is going to define your entire future. Um, I think is really important. And there's just so much opportunity out there that just take advantage of it. And, and the biggest constraint is yourself, right? And the biggest constraint is what you you are able to unleash and how much risk you're willing willing to take. And so surround yourself with people who mentor you, surround yourself by people who give you self-confidence and give you courage, right? I think that's really important as you go anywhere in life, but definitely coming out when you're younger, we question ourselves so much. This is fantastic. Take risks, have courage, experiment right now, learn from your whatever hasn't worked out well, and then move on. I love the fact the way you mentioned that all careers, despite whichever sector you are in, it's like a zigzag movement. So there's no straight path out there and you will eventually reach your goal. Thank you so much, Neera, for joining us. This was a fantastic conversation. Yeah, fun. Let's stay in touch. Yes, thank you.